Hello class. The lecture today will be on vacuum transducers. We're still measuring pressure. This is the last lecture on that. We'll be moving on to measuring flow, which has a lot of aspects in it involving measuring pressure, but it's kind of a new subject. So here, measuring vacuums, let's get started with that. We have a couple review questions to start with about other pressure measurements. So the first one, so this has to do with thin wall diaphragms. The upper frequency range limit of a thin wall diaphragm pressure transducer is, we have A, B, C, and D. Why don't, you, why don't you pause and think about that for a second and come back when you have an answer. Okay, welcome back. The answer is D, all of the above. We remember we just learned that the upper limit of a thin wall diaphragm pressure transducer is one third of the natural frequency. That's just the, the properties of that thin wall diaphragm. We want to keep well below the natural frequency so it doesn't tear itself apart. So we get a, an even response. Then B is true also. That has to do with what we learned way back with sampling rates. And then C again is kind of like A. It's just something we learned about the thin walled diaphragms recently. It is dependent on the diaphragm thickness and diameter. So D, all of the above, is the best answer. This is another one from what we just covered. The output of a strain gauge pressure transducer will lag behind the actual pressure change due to the inertia of the diaphragm. True or false? Pause it. Think about it. Welcome back. It's true. Remember, there's mass there. There's movement. So there's, there's going to be a lag behind due to that inertia. OK, now on to the topic of vesher, vacuum pressure measurement. I combine those into one word, vesher. Don't do that. It's vacuum pressure. So the first question is, what is a vacuum? You probably have a good idea of what this is. So the word it comes from means a void. Vacuus or something like that in Latin, but it means a void. So it can mean the ideal condition of a perfect vacuum where there's nothing in there. I don't know that there is a true perfect vacuum. Even outer space has a you know, little bit of particles in it. It's an extremely small amount. But um, that just leads us to needing these varying degrees. And that's more what we are interested in in engineering. So it typically means a space where pressure is lower than atmospheric pressure. And we're going to divide it into all these different categories. We'll do that on a slide coming up. This picture here is from um, an early experiment. The, there was a lot of interesting debate about whether or not a vacuum could be created and a lot of interesting experiments to make it happen. Like they'd take bellows and seal the end of it and have teams of horses pull, try to pull it apart. In the, I think it's like the 17th century when they finally were actually able to create a pressure, or sorry, create a vacuum and measure it. But people have been discussing that since at least ancient Greece. Anyways, that is one of those early experiments there. They would just suck all the air out of there to create a vacuum with that, that pump. So we already saw this slide. Here we were talking about the different types of pressure. Remember, a lot of times we're talking about gauge pressure, which is the difference between ambient and whatever pressure we're interested in. Absolute is the difference between that pressure and a perfect vacuum. Well, I'm showing this again because anything less than this is what we would consider a vacuum. So everything. Everything in this range is a vacuum. 
There are some units you should be familiar with, some of them already. But, um, let's start with one atmosphere. So these are mostly some conversion factors here that could be useful for you in solving problems. These would probably be good things. Oh, actually, all of this would be good things to have on a note sheet for the final. One atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury. So remember, with the U2 manometers, the fluid column height, that's where that comes from. So 700, if you have mercury as your manometer fluid, if it displaced at 760 millimeters, that pressure would be one atmosphere. And one tor is equal to one millimeter of mercury. Or actually, I should say it's roughly equal to. Those originally were defined to be the same thing, but somewhere along the line they got changed. Slight, they're slightly different now. I don't know why they decided that was better, but there's a slight difference. It's something like 0.000015%, something like that. Just some really small difference. But um, you know, for all practical purposes, just assume those. One tor is one millimeter of mercury. That tor was named after uh, Evangelista Tor. Torricelli, something like that, an Italian physicist who was kind of influential in early pressure measurements. I think he may have discovered the, the barometer. Anyways, the last one here is one millimeter of mercury, which is equal to 133.3 pascals. So there's some useful conversions for you. Now for the classifications of the different vacuums. Now note here, low vacuum goes from 760 down to 25 torr. So we're starting at one atmosphere at ambient, which is 760 millimeters of mercury or torr. It says here down to 25. The medium vacuum goes from 25 down to 10 to the negative third torr. High vacuum goes from 10 to the negative third down to 10 to the negative sixth. Very high vacuum. These are some really inventive names, but that's what they are. So it goes from 10 to the negative sixth to 10 to the negative ninth tor. And an ultra high vacuum is anything less than 10 to the negative ninth. So, uh, standard vacuum cleaner provides 10 to 20 kilopascals or 75 to 150 tor. So that would be in this low vacuum range, right? So from 75 to 150. It, actually, if we're going from ambient to lower pressure, we'd say from 150 torr, which is kind of more at the lower pressure end of a low vacuum, down to even lower at the lower end of that low vacuum, which would be 75 torr. Then outer space is 10 to the negative 12th torr, so thousandth of this a thousandth of the where the ultra high vacuum classification starts now we're going to go over some vacuum applications first the barometer we've we've already mentioned I mentioned that earlier just in this lecture we studied it a couple lectures ago this is for measuring atmospheric pressure in, in absolute terms, so the, um, the capillary, the, the P2, is evacuated. We have a vacuum there. Freeze drying foods is another application. With all the COVID-19 stuff, you guys are all freeze drying all your foods to prepare for multi-year crisis. Uh, I'm just kidding. Hopefully we'll be done with all this soon. Here we have, so this slide shows that vacuums are used in computer chips or microfabrication. This guy here isn't in a vacuum. He would implode, or not implode, he'd explode. If he was, it's, it's more this thing back here. 
So light bulbs, there's a vacuum created inside of those to get those air or the, the particles out of the, the light bulb helps to make it last longer. And yes, this is the Death Star. So lasers, they work better if you can use them in a vacuum. It helps to focus them. It helps to avoid the dielectric breakdown. Here we have vacuum tubes. This is an older technology, uh, but people still really like them. They'll pay a lot of money for them. Audiophiles, musicians, they, they really like that sound. If, if you compare these to modern solid state amplifiers, they're technically not as good. Um, you know, they add coloration to it. They're not as efficient, but that, that coloration that it adds to it, and just the, the sound it creates, it, maybe we're just creatures of habit and all the, you know, the great music from the, the 70s that was produced with that technology. That's what we've grown to, to like. That's our standard. So this thing that is technically not as good is preferred, and people pay a lot more money to get that. You'd pay $850 for this tube app when you get a solid state one that's um, equivalent in terms of output for much less, a couple hundred instead of 850. I know because I bought that one. But anyways, I digress. Here we have for space exploration. That's the application. Space exploration design testing, just like it says up here. So NASA has a vacuum chamber the size of a house, the, which is the Plum Brook Station, and then they have a larger one, the Apollo General Vacuum, which is this one. If you look down here, we have this wee little man, or okay, we have a whole crew of them. Sometimes I don't even notice those guys. Um, you can see how, how small they are, or what is more important is how big this vacuum is. Um, X-ray tubes, you can thank them for every time you get scanned at the airport. Other things too, taking X-rays, you know, make sure you're, you didn't damage your neck too much. Okay, now we're going to move on to measuring. The first thing, a lot of the devices we've already discussed, so manometers, Bourdon gauges, and systems that use bellows and diaphragms, they can measure medium and even high vacuums down to 10 to the negative fourth power. But we're going to focus on the devices that are specifically meant for vacuums that go from this range and even to what you call a higher vacuum, which would be lower pressure. How do we do that? We're going to study three devices. The first one is the McLeod gauge. We see it here. We have two different states of this. We have state A and state B. This, like it says down here, it measures the vacuum mechanically. The principle is it compresses a large volume of low pressure gas into a smaller volume. So and it, and through that, you measure pressure. So I'll walk through showing this device next um, here in a second. Maybe I should just say that again without stumbling through it. I was kind of getting ahead of myself. On the next slide, we'll sell this picture and we'll have the steps and I can point out where they happen up here. But again, the principle is you compress a large volume of low pressure gas into smaller volume and then it allows you to measure the pressure. So more specifically how that's done, the gauge is connected to a vacuum. So right here, we have the vacuum pressure comes in and it fills this volume V with that low pressure gas that is our vacuum. And then the next step is this plunger is depressed. And that's when we transition over here to this state B. It's depressed until the mercury rises up to H2, which corresponds to the top of H1. So there's this capillary here where all that volume of gas gets 
compressed into here. And because you're taking that really low pressure gas, compressing it, it's a higher pressure. So now you can get a measurable fluid column. So said that three gas contained in volume V is compressed into capillary one. Now we'll derive the equation that we use for these. We start with Boyle's law. So pressure one and volume one, that would be the volume, the vacuum pressure and the volume here equals pressure two and the volume two. Volume two is going to be what's left of this capillary here. So since that's so much smaller, P2 is going to have to be so much higher. And then here we're just writing it out in the, the terms of that figure. So the vacuum pressure times the volume of that reservoir equals the final pressure times the cross-sectional area of the capillary times the fluid height. So this is like it says here, typically it's mercury, and it's the difference between H2, H2, and H1. So, so it's kind of like a U2 manometer, but we really need to compress the gas down first to make it something that's measurable. Then, based on the apparatus design, the final pressure is going to be the pressure of the vacuum plus the density of the fluid times gravity times the height. So if, if we still have that vacuum up here, we still have this whole system, right? This is all the, the vacuum pressure. So this is going to be, sorry, this is going to be this plus the density times the gravity times the height. That's what that one is. So we have these two relations for the final pressure. So this one comes from this being rearranged, right? We just move cross-sectional area and the height over to this side. So now we have that equation here. We have this one based on the apparatus design. So we make this equal to this. So that's what we have here. And then we need to rearrange this. So, so this is that equation, equation where we made the, the two relations we had come up with, make them equal to each other, combine them into one. You know, then we rearrange for what we are typically interested in, which would be the vacuum pressure. Density, gravity, cross-sectional area, height squared over the volume minus cross-sectional area times the height. And usually the volume is much greater than the cross-sectional area times the height, so we just get rid of that part. And this is this is the equation we use. So now the pros and cons, the, the pro is it's simple and reliable. Just because of that, it's, it's still used. Um, I guess I'll skip ahead to the bottom line down there. This is being replaced by electronic gauges, but it's still useful, still used. So let's go over the reasons why it's being replaced by electronic gauges. Those are the, the six bullet points there under cons. So it's limited to static measurements. If the pressure of that vacuum is changing, it's not something you're going to be able to measure in any kind of real time. It has limited accuracy, so you typically have 1% or greater error. Condensation may occur during the compression stage, which results in more error. It cannot be used in zero gravity environments. You need gravity for that fluid column to mean anything. The liquid in the McLeod gauge must not interact with targeted gas and contamination by mercury vapors may occur. Remember, mercury is toxic, so gotta be careful. Now, one of those more modern devices, the Piran gauge, we, we see it up here. We have this heating filament 
and we have this chamber where we allow vacuum in. And the resistance is going to be a, a key thing here. The, 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 getting a little bit ahead of myself, but the, the change in pressure is going to result in a change in resistance. Now, I'll walk you through how we get to that. But because of that, we put it into our trusty old stone bridge. So we have an active chamber, a reference chamber, two fixed resistors, and then we commission output voltage with our DAC, which allows us to have dynamic measurements. But let's get back to the part about how, how this works. So it says Prani gauge measures the vacuum based on gas thermal conductivity. So at low pressures, the gas thermal conductivity depends on pressure. So this, this is just talking about how it's a half bridge sealed in a reference chamber. But the part about how all this vacuum being measured due to the thermal conductivity and how that affects resistance, we're getting into that now. So if we have a change in pressure of the vacuum, that results in the change in the filament's thermal output. It's actually, more specifically, it's a change in the transfer of the heat produced by the filament to the chamber walls. Right? If you're just applying a, a current, current here, a constant current, then it's going to produce a certain amount of heat. And that's not going to change unless you change that current. But if you're applying that current and you the pressure drops, so you go to a higher vacuum, then the thermal conductivity to the wall is going to drop. So it's going to heat up in here more. And when it heats up, you get more resistance. So that is what changes the bridge up. So on this slide, we have the equation for the heat transfer. So it's a constant, which depends on the gas, wall temperature, chamber geometry, and filament surface area. You could get that through calibration. The, the main thing then is going to be that difference between the filament temperature and the, the filament temperature and the chamber wall temperature. Um, so you can get the, the vacuum pressure from all of that. So as the vacuum pressure goes down, this is what we said, the, the difference between the wall and the filament is going to increase because, like we said, the lower vacuum, or the higher vacuum, the lower pressure is not going to allow, it's going to result in lower thermal conductivity from the filament to the wall. So, like, so more specifically, the filament temperature goes up from less heat transfer to the wall. And like we said also, through calibration, the filament temperature can be correlated to pressure. So this one goes from ambient down to 10 to the negative fourth tor. So it goes significantly lower than the, the McLeod or the, and the other vices that we, that we talked about. Those bombed out around 10 to the negative fourth. Um, I guess I didn't think this was so far back, but here we're, we're getting into the high vacuum. We covered a lot of ground there. Let's get back to where I was. I'll try not to go back so far. And very robust. There's not many problems associated with this, like we had problems associated with the McLeod gauge. Now, the last one, the ionization vacuum gauges. So this one is more complicated. The, so, so we have a couple different circuits in here. 
we'll attack this from a few different approaches. We'll get down to the words down here, but there's, there's one circuit here between this plate or iron collector and then there's another circuit here from this grid. And the main thing is that there's this, this cathode here. So this cathode uh, current is sent through there. I, I guess so we have a, a third circuit. Um, cathode, so a current is sent through here, and essentially this cathode boils electrons off of it. And the vacuum comes into this chamber here. And then depending on how many particles are in there, so depending on the pressure, those electrons that are boiled off here, they're either going to collect on the grid or on the plate, depending on if it comes in contact with a gas molecule or not. So the ratio between these two currents, that ratio is going to be what... Um, what we determine the vacuum pressure from. So let's go through all the notes I wrote on here. The premise is a gas is ionized as energetic electrons pass through. So we have our vacuum gas and these electrons that are boiled off of this cathode pass through it. And that gas is ionized by those. So the number of molecules ionized depends on the density, thus the pressure, the vacuum pressure. So if it's a uh, higher pressure or lower vacuum, there are going to be more particles that are ionized and more that are going to go to the plate. So if, if it's a higher pressure, there are more molecules, more ionized molecules, and more current there. It's like we said that heated cathode essentially boils off electrons. Electron current results between the cathode and the grid. The ionization of gas creates positively charged ions and more electrons. So the plate is negatively charged and it attracts those gas ions, like we said. And then the electrons accumulate at the grid. So the, the ratio between the two of these is going to be where we get the vacuum pressure. And that's what this equation shows. So this is a, the ratio of the ions on the grid, sorry, on the plate. It, and we use this word plate loosely. I'm going to show you a video of one of these where it, it doesn't so much resemble a plate. It's more like a, a rod, but um, it doesn't really matter. Conductive surface. I guess plate or ion collector. Let's just call it ion collector. Um, the grid, though, that, that that's a more specific terminology. So that's where the electrons that boil off and don't come in contact with any of the, the gas. Or I guess when some of the gas comes in and becomes ionized, that produces more electrons, so those go there. But um, in any case, the, the ratio between these two currents are going to give us our vacuum, so long as we have this constant. And again, the constant depends on the dimensions and the geometry of the filament grid, the plate, the gas properties, and that is also something you get through calibration. So this one can measure all the way down to outer space, the near perfect vacuum of outer space. But in this case, you actually have an upper limit because the filament will oxidize if there's too much gas coming in here. So you, you don't want that to happen. It's got to stay in a pressure below 10 to the negative third torr. Now here is that video that animates this. January 2017. Hey, what's up? The hot filament ionization gauge is used to measure vacuum in a pressure range from 10 power minus 1 to 10 power minus 9 pascal. In this device, the pressure is obtained by first ionizing the gas and then measuring the ion current. In order to ionize the gas, the cathode is heated up to high temperatures where it starts emitting electrons. 
These emitted electrons are then accelerated towards the anode. If the electrons interact with gas molecules, then these gas molecules are ionized. The heating is done by passing current through the filament. Since the collector has a negative potential, it attracts positive ions and repels negative electrons. An emitter connected to the collector measures the ion current, which is calibrated into units of pressure. The ionization probability is different for gases, and this affects the device's sensitivity. For example, the calibration is often done with nitrogen, but with xenon, the ionization probability is three times smaller, and with helium, about six times bigger. This system is excellent for measuring medium and high vacuum, but at very low pressures, it becomes inaccurate. Now, this table compares the ranges that each of the different devices you covered can measure. So this would be um, a so, so both vacuums and pre and pressures above ambient. That ionization gauge, clearly, if you're, if you're going to measure a really high vacuum or low pressure, that's that's the way to go. Have an example here for you. This, this is an example of the McLeod gauge. It says here we need to measure from 10 to the negative second to 10 to the negative fifth millimeters of mercury. The reservoir volume is four liters. And then here we have this conversion for you that one liter equals 0 0.001 meters cubed. The capillary diameter is one millimeter. So the question is, what fluid column height must you accommodate? The specific gravity of the mercury is provided for you. So you have this column of column height of mercury. This is that specific gravity. Now to solve this, the you have these two different pressures, right? You want to measure this pressure range. Maybe you should pause this and think about this for a little while. I would ask you to tell me what we should do in class, and I would stare at you for a while until somebody actually said something. But you're only going to need to solve for one of these, right? You need to solve for the worst case scenario. So what fluid column height? must you accommodate? Which of these is going to result in the greatest fluid column height? Th that's going to direct you towards you only have to solve this once instead of twice. So hopefully you've paused this and thought about that and you have an answer. The, the answer is that the higher pressure is going to result in that, the greater fluid column, right? So the 10 to the negative second millimeters of mercury, that is the greater pressure. So that, that's the one we want to calculate for. So plan for worst case, therefore our pressure of our vacuum is going to be 10 to the negative second millimeters of mercury. Then the next thing is what equation do we use? This is that equation we derive for the McLeod gauge. Since we are trying to solve it for the fluid column height, we need to rearrange like, like this. So we have that up here. And now it's just a lot of getting our the different things we were given into the right form for putting into that equation. First, we have vacuum pressure. So we were given that in 10 to the negative second millimeters of mercury. But we're going to need, for all of our units to work out, we should convert this to pascals. And it's 
because we can convert that to newtons per meter squared. And we can convert that to kilograms times meter per meter squared per second squared. This. So this is one of those conversion factors I gave you. So we just multiply this times this, and we get a vacuum pressure of 1.333 pascals. Remember, pascals, newtons per meter squared. Also, we, we can break our newtons down more. That'll make all of our units work out. And then the volume, we were, in that problem statement, we were given that one liter equals one thousandth of a meter cubed. So our four liter volume is 0 0.004 meters cubed. And we were given a specific gravity for mercury equal to 13.6. This is this is the equation for specific gravity, the density of the fluid over the density of water. Remember, that's 4 degrees Celsius, which is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So if we want the density of the fluid or the density of the mercury, we just multiply the density of water times the 13.6 and we get 13.6 kilograms per meter cubed. Now we can start plugging things into here. We put that 1.333 pascals right here. We put the 0 0.004 meters cubed for our volume right here. For the density, we got 13,600 kilograms per meter cubed. Gravity, you should just know is 9.81 meters per second squared. And then the cross-sectional area, so we were given a diameter of one millimeter. So we have to have one millimeter squared, which is one millimeter squared. We need to convert this to meters so it works with the rest of our units. So one meter is a thousand millimeters, and we need to square that because it's squared here. And then we need to multiply times pi to the or divide by four because it's the diameter. So if we do that and we solve all of this, we get 225.6 millimeters. So um, probably a little under a foot, right? It's, um, so 225.6 millimeters, that's the answer. That's it for this lecture. See you later.